Pat with Pat's Two Cents. This weekend we are celebrating resurrection. Amen. All right. Number one. This is Mark chapter 16, verse starting at verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they came unto the sepulcher. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, and they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great, and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were affrighted. That means they were afraid. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And he, he, she went and told them what had happened with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them. And they walked and went into the country and they went and told it unto the residue neither believed they them (laughs) so nobody was believing what was going on Mm, mm, mm. afterwards he appeared unto the eleven and they sat at me and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart that means um, upbraided means he he rebuked them he fussed at them for not believing because of the hardness of their heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto him, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now, let me say this to you. The same way Jesus was taken up into heaven in a cloud is the same way God's people will be taken up into heaven. Those who are, who who have the Messiah as their Lord and Savior, not those who believe, because those who believe include demons. The Bible says the devils believe and tremble. But you notice they ain't getting heaven. So when you believe, it has to go further than just a mind belief, just uh, an agreement that he was. So let me say this to you. You notice the only way that Mary knew that Jesus had risen from the dead was because she was so hungry. Listen to this. She was so hungry for her Lord. She was yearning, hurting, mourning. Everything was going on in her heart at one time. They were preparing him 
not realizing there was nothing there to prepare because he was not dead. He was risen. He is risen indeed. So a lot of you think Jesus is dead. A lot of born again Christians have a difficult time believing for the things that Jesus is able to do in your life now. Why do you have a difficult time believing? How could you doubt? Well, before you beat yourself up too much, you notice Jesus had to fuss at the disciples who had walked with him, who had seen his miracles firsthand, who had, they had eyewitnessed his power. They heard God speak out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. All kind of things proving who the Messiah really is. And they still doubted. Peter went back to fishing. I mean, everybody was in serious doubt. So when we go through life and its vicissitudes and we find ourselves doubting, we find ourselves full of fear, worry, anxiety, anguish. The main thing we have to do is keep going back to Jesus. We have to go to God and talk to him, pour your heart out to him. Don't let the challenges of life overwhelm you because when Jesus rose from the dead, baby, he conquered death, he conquered sin, he conquered the world, and he conquered sickness. He conquered every demonic entity. He conquered the devil, hell, the grave, everything. So when you're going through, remember your Redeemer lives. Remember Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Don't sit there and succumb to the circumstances and feel hopeless. Don't allow yourself to fall down that pit. Don't go in the neighborhood. Start quoting scripture about who God is. I was doing that last night. I, I feel like my body benefited from it. Listen, remember who God is. He is not a dead savior. God is not dead. God has not lost this battle to the devil. God is in control. Jesus is your resurrection and your life. But you have to put all of your problems, all of your worries and bring them to Jesus. You have to do that. You can't try to handle everything figuring it out. You have to go to him. You need wisdom, you go to him. You need more knowledge, you go to him. You need help, you go to him. He will help you come up with all kinds of ideas of how to get the help you need. Because God is not just a God in heaven. God is right here on earth. I don't know if you guys saw the movie, uh, His Only Son. You got to see that movie. There was one scene. I really was tempted to videotape just that scene because Abraham was, was, he was in anguish. He was crying out to God, can't you find another way? Not understanding the purpose and the prophetic uh, unction that was behind what God required of him to give his son as a sacrifice. So here, the father who loves his only son is crying his eyes out. Listen to this. And as he's crying his eyes out, he's looking around and God's not showing up. There is no angel. There's no light beam. There's no thunder, no nothing. And he's crying his eyes out. And then he just, he's on his knees, just looking around and waiting and nothing's happening. And he feels like, okay, I said my piece, but I don't know what God's doing. And he felt alone. The way the camera zoomed out, you could tell he felt alone out there in the wilderness among the tumbleweeds and the sand. 
He felt alone in the middle of the night, crying, crying, because he was at his wit's end with no answer. He felt so alone. And as the camera zooms out, the God that he did not see was standing right there listening to every word. And I say to you, he is listening to you. When you feel like nobody cares and nobody has an ear to hear, when you feel like it's hopeless, God hears you. He hears you. He's right there. You've got his undivided attention because God is drawn to hunger. God is drawn to pain. God is drawn to your darkness because he always wills to bring light to your darkness, to shed light on your pathway. He is always right there to give you hope. But there are times when he can't afford to answer you because the process must go on and it has to progress. You have to go through all the motions, all the emotions, all the movements, all the actions to get through that chapter in your life. But don't think he's not there. He's right there with you. When the men on Emmaus Road, when Jesus showed up to them in another form, they thought they were talking to some unknown traveler on the road. Why? God had not opened their eyes. So there was no way for them to recognize Jesus. And they're mourning him and, 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 and re, rehearsing all of the events of that weekend. And they are yearning for their savior. They're hungering, they're hurting. And they don't realize their savior is right there in their midst. Whatever you're going through, God is right there in your midst. You're never alone. He promised he will never leave you nor forsake you. You're never alone. Don't feel abandoned by God, whatever you do. When the men on Emmaus Road were beckoning for him to stay and break bread, and, and, and when Jesus poured the wine, broke the bread and poured the wine, when he, when he, uh, when he supped with them, all of that, when they got to a certain point, he was about to move on, but they begged him to stay. There's that hunger. Then Jesus opened their eyes and they recognized their savior. And they were saying, didn't our hearts yearn? Didn't our hearts burn within us? Why? Because they wanted their savior. See, some of the problem with a lot of born again Christians is we have the salvation. We have the Bible. We have the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. And we get a high from speaking in tongues. We get a high from prophesying. We get a high when the Lord lays a word of exhortation on us. When we're operating in our gift, we get a high from it. But the one thing a lot of Christians don't experience is God himself. They don't experience hearing his voice, feeling his presence, that supernatural manifestation of his presence. One night, to share this with you, one night I was extremely lonely. I had just gotten saved to show you how available God really is. Like I said, what draws his attention is hunger and pain or desperation. I was in my living room. I had only been saved one month. I was fussing at the Lord because I'm calling everybody at church and nobody's answering the phone. Well, I'm a night owl by nature, even since my childhood. And it's easy for me to stay up till one, two, three, four, five in the morning. It's easy. I lose track of time until I'm actually and literally dozing off. So I love, I love being up. I just love being up, especially in the night when it's peaceful and I just love it. 
So here I am, lonely, bored, no money, no car. And listen to this. My father's in the hospital. I'm at home. And now I'm alone. I visited him in the hospital, but now it's nighttime. I'm alone. And see, I used to live the nightlife. I, I, uh, whatever that song is, street life. That was the, that was the life I knew, the street life. I was out there partying, boogieing back. Now, here I am saved now. I don't play that music anymore. I don't go to the club anymore. I don't hang out with my friends who do what I'm trying not to do anymore. So here I am lonely and bored. And I never knew how painful loneliness could be. Listen to this. I was fussing at the Lord about how I felt. And how the church people are nowhere to be found. They're either out and about having fun themselves or they're in bed asleep. But nobody was there for me. I couldn't find a soul. And I was all caught up in me, myself, and I. I was still a big baby, baby Christian. All right. While I'm crying to the Lord, it finally dawned on me to ask. I mean, my face was soaked with tears, y'all. Lord. Do you ever keep us company when we're lonely like this? I mean, I was so lonely. I was I was lonely and bored to tears, literally. <clears throat> Listen, all of a sudden, because I cried out in desperation. The reason I was suffering was because my neighbor across the street was playing the music that I stopped listening to. And the music started stirring up the old flesh. I'm lonely. I'm bored. Now the music's making me get hot and bothered on top of it. And I wanted to get back into the nightclub. And I'm fighting tooth and nail to obey the way I know God wants me to obey. I'm not allowing myself. Mm. I'm not allowing myself the excuses to go on and disobey and go back to my old ways. So here I am, lonely, desperate, and and bored. And now the music is stirring up my flesh. Now I got another battle to fight, and I'm at my wit's end. And I'm crying, Lord, do you keep us company? I can't do this by myself. I was just so, I, I, oh my goodness. I was overwhelmed. And do you know, all of a sudden, it was as if the music volume went down and I saw something moving in my upper right-hand corner of my living room. I'll never forget this. And I saw movement slowly descending. And as soon as it got halfway between the wall between the ceiling and me, I knew it was the manifest presence of Jesus Christ himself. Now, I didn't see detail, but in my heart, my mind, and my spirit, I knew what position he was in. And as he descended, he landed right in front of me. I was sitting, and he landed in a seated position with his knees and his feet in front of my knees and my feet. And he had his hands on his thighs and he sat there. Now, I know what position he was in exactly, but I can't tell you what he looked like. It's the hardest thing to describe when you see things in the spirit. As soon as he landed, I knew it was Jesus. I knew it was God in the form of Jesus. Let's put it like that. It's like he wanted me to come face to face with my Savior. So here I am sitting face to face with my savior. And he doesn't say a mumbling word, y'all. But I am so full. Oh my God. The feeling of being in his presence like that. Oh, God is drawn. He was with me. I, I mean, now I would normally not have even started to get sleepy. Because of the time I woke up, I woke up around two that afternoon. I would normally not have started to get sleepy till five or six in the morning. It was only 11 something at night. 
do you know only 15 or 20 minutes sitting in his presence was so overwhelming? And I could tell he put a divine sleep on me because it was as if somebody shot me up with a a, a sedative and I couldn't keep my eyes open. And I'm, I'm talking and I'm giddy and I'm laughing and I'm crying and I couldn't believe the excitement of being in his presence. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm like, Lord, I got to lay down. I was like, I couldn't help it. I had to. I got to lay down. Please come in the bedroom with me. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. I had a hunger. I was desperate. I was hurting and lonely. What do you do when you get in that condition? You turn on the TV. You dial your friends and chit chat on the phone. What do you do? You go out, call somebody up for a date, call somebody to come keep you company. So what I did was I lay down in the bed and I felt his presence. It was still with me. I don't know when I fell asleep, but all I know is I woke up the next morning and I had to either go to school or go to, I couldn't remember what it was I had to do, but I had to get on the bus and go somewhere. It might've been to go see Pop, I don't know, in the hospital. But I got up and when I got up, I opened my, when I opened my eyes, his presence was still right there with me. That giddy joy was still right there. I said, oh my God, Lord, you stayed with me. When I got up, I washed up, I put my clothes on, I headed out the door. He was right there with me, and I'm just running my mouth, running my mouth, talking to him. We, I get out, I walk down Mountain View all the way to Lake to Lincoln Avenue, and I, I'm standing there waiting for the bus. And as soon as I got on the bus, paid my thing, and sat in the chair. That's when I began to feel that presence lift because God knew I wouldn't be good. I would be, I would be good for nothing (laughs) that day. I wouldn't be able to function with all of that overwhelming giddy joy. So that was when that manifest presence lifted. You have no idea what you can experience if you cry out to God with all the pain, with all your desperation. You talk to people, you talk to your buddies, you talk to to your, your neighbor, whoever you're talking to. But when was the last time you cried out to God and said, don't leave me, stay with me? When was the last time you ever experienced his supernatural touch, his supernatural love? It's galactic, it's majestic, it's celestial. Nothing, nothing like the love you experience on this earth. Nothing at all. Totally different. And totally mm -mm -mm, pure, clean, strong, gentle, ah, mighty, and kind. Ah, I'm telling you, I can come up with all the different words in the world, but you will never feel what that feels like unless you're hungry, desperate, longing for him. We long for his blessings. But when was the last time you simply long for him? We'll long for a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a visit with a cousin or an old buddy that we used to know. We'll long to go to Disneyland. We'll long to go on this beautiful vacation. When was the last time you longed for him like Mary Magdalene did at the sepulcher? They were longing for their Lord like the men on Emmaus Road. They were longing for the Lord. When you look at one of the other gospels, the reason Mary experienced him was because but right around dawn, they run to the sepulcher. And when it was, when they got to the sepulcher and they saw the stone rolled away and it was empty, this is, this is what happened. Check this out. <clears throat> she uh, told the disciples and they came and they looked in and then they went about their business. They said, okay, 
He ain't home. Lights on. Nobody's home. They go about their business. What does Mary do? She stoops back down and she looks. She goes in. She comes back out. She walks around the garden. She's looking. What is she looking for? When they put my Savior, I want my Savior. I want my Savior. Where is he? Disciples are heading back. But Mary's hanging around. She's not leaving. She's not going to leave her Savior's side for nothing. So she's over there looking. And then she, she runs up on who she thinks is a gardener. And the gardener, he turns around and she's saying, Lord, where have they laid my Savior? Where have they taken him? Her hunger. Do you know why Jesus showed up in the garden? Because of Mary Magdalene's hunger. That's what brings God down to earth in your life in a manifest presence. You hunger to know him. You hunger to be with him. You hunger to hear his voice. You hunger and long for his love. You long for his touch. You long for him to validate who you are in him. You long to hear what his will is for your life. You long to please him and put a smile on his face. You long for him. You can't long for somebody you don't know. And some of you, you think you know the Lord. No, you believe in him. That's good. You live for him. That's good. You live a holy life. You go to church. You pay your tithes. You pay your offerings. You do your services. You do whatever for the Lord. But do you long for him, for his beauty, for his essence, for his presence right there in your midst? When was the long, the last time you cried out for him? Not what he has in his hand. Not for the fringe benefits of walking with the Lord, but for him. Mm. You will find the more you hunger for him. Actually, you will see the more he moves in your life on your behalf. Because it is your hunger that draws his heart to you. It's your hunger that draws his power to move in your life. Why? You're hungering for him. And he's not going to stand you up. He's, an, he's a very present, ever present God. Very present help in need. And always remember, no matter what you're going through in your life, God has the answer. Because he knew about the problem before the problem ever reared its ugly head. He already knew. He is the resurrection. He is the life. God is. He is the great I am. Not the great I was. Not the great I will be. He is the great I am. That covers past, present, future, eternity. He is the resurrection, and the life. For those of you who don't know him, sit down and think about it for a minute and ask God into your life. Ask him to be your savior. Ask him to forgive you and enable you to forgive. Heal your heart from all the past hurts and all the hangups, insecurities, all of the little bondages and the, and the, and the, the hangups you have. And then ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit, because it's only with his Holy Spirit that you will be enabled to walk according to his will by the power of his Holy Spirit and the power of his might. God bless you as you celebrate the resurrection and the life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, be with you always in Jesus' name. Amen.